as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, reporting live from the cam. High in demand, so please stand by if you can. What we got is worth a lot, so put a tie on your plans. On court, talking sports through the eyes of the fans. With Trip Young, Emma Marie, Eric Sanchez. You heard what I said, we elite. Check the latest topics and stay ahead of the beat. Keep us in your topics and uh -huh. we ahead of the Yo. streets. It's Johnny Floss, bringing a different type of blend. Backing up Misfit to make sure y'all tuned in. You gotta watch, this show is one of a kind. Updates on your TV screen from 8 to 9. For the older folks, so even if you're younger, no matter what sport, this show, we got it covered. It's filmed live in the middle of BK, so ain't no better sports show to watch on Thursdays. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Hey, what's going on, guys? Thank you for joining us for another live episode of Real Fans, Real Talk. I am your host, Emeril Marie, and I have my two favorite guys with me, as always, Anthony, a.k.a. Trip Young, and Eric, a.k.a. Legend in Two Games. So we are coming out of quarantine. I don't know if you're still calling this the quarantine edition, but we're hitting phase by phase. The whole world is opening, so slowly we're getting back to normal. How are you guys doing? You guys getting haircuts? guys getting... I got my eyebrows done. <laughs> you look good, Em. Yeah, you look good, Em. And I, I'm, a, I'm still a little skeptical of, of just kind of going back out there. As you said, we're slowly seeing the economy open back up phase by phase. Um, it's a good thing, but I think we still should proceed with caution. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, I, was out, I was outside today. Um, thank you guys, actually, for waiting until later to, uh, to start. I was out shooting a music video um, for this, uh, this, this was, it's a gospel record, but it's also a woman's empowerment thing. So they were, um, you know, in part scenes in the video was them protesting, um, you know, with everything that's been going on. And I know, Amber, you have been really on the front lines doing your thing. And I'm so proud of you, truly. Thank you so much. Um, today was insane. So my sister actually is the one to give so much credit for it. She's the one that was going harder i had a super busy week working so i wasn't as involved as organizing this um however you know i just try to use my platform and push it but basically we facilitated a protest in our hometown and this was very special for us um, my sister and i were one of the few black families here we're five generations here and babylon village long island is predominantly white so this was really heavy this is a red red town um long island is the fifth most segregated place in america um part, partly because of robert moses who um instilled the the segregation of the bridges and the construction the way he constructed it he didn't want uh buses to come through different areas right so again babylon is super super white and there was a lot of as this moved into the town people told me that they were, they were knocking on each other's doors last night saying there's a, there's a protest tomorrow and looting and rioting. and people were terrified. This came out to be the most beautiful, impactful, I mean, black, white, Spanish, so many different races just chanting. And um, I mean, we were saying no racist police. We were saying white silence is violence. We were saying black lives matter. We encountered some blocks where some neighbors were saying, fuck you, you know, middle finger to us cursing us out and we just kind of stayed in front of their their house with the blow horn and it was interesting because you've seen some neighbors that were saying f you when we were saying black lives matter they were so angry but then the two neighbors beside them had their kids out and they were waving with waters and with black lives matter signs so y'all know i talk a lot of mess so with my blow horn i was like everyone stop and look at karen who was very angry that we matter very angry then i'm like Hey, guess what? Your neighbors are racist. All the racists are coming out right now. They're all coming outside. So let's observe all the racists coming outside because they're so angry. And guess what? All lives ma don't matter until Black Lives Matter. So again, Black Lives Matter. So it was just very <laughs> crazy. Um, I'm sure we'll end up playing a clip at some point, even on the show, hopefully. There was a moment where I really got choked up and I started crying, which that definitely, like, that rush came out when I think that people learn best when you're storytelling and when you're giving them 
real encounters of what you experience. And in my town, a lot of people feel like it's a their, it's they it's their problem, not an us problem. So when we were chanting white silence is violence, I can hear even in the crowd behind us getting quiet. They weren't saying it as loud and proud as, as they were saying Black Lives Matter. And I stopped and explained what that means by saying white silence is violence, that that means check your counterparts. You know, as they as they had their knee on Floyd's neck, not one of his counterparts checked him and said, that's enough. At the five minute and 24 second mark is when he started to call for his mother. And it's, and it's so, I think white silence is violence because if your white counterparts are acting out, you are a part of the problem. And you can't be lukewarm. You can't be a non-racist. You're either anti or you're racist. So I made that loud and clear today in this town for those who felt like this wasn't a, their problem. Um, so the footage was even watching it back now and seeing the amount of people and the response and everyone come out from their stores and everyone outside, it was crazy. And we're so well known in our town that people were like, those are the Vickers girls. So I think even being, having the privilege of being an athlete and um, being an athlete and being well liked, it made, I think the white people here realize this was a family that all six kids went to college. All six kids were, at, were outstanding athletes and contributed to Babylon Village culture and they're upset. So I think it hit home for the people who seen us because everyone recognized. I was, I was marching, waving to, like I recognized people's parents. I went to, this is a small town. So this was, this was heavy today. And um, when I was done, I just, I just sat in my car and I was, whew, Channel 12 was there. It was crazy. It was crazy, but um, it felt good to contribute and it felt really genuine. And it felt like all the conversations I have with my friends quietly, I got to scream it on top of my lungs today. And so it, I felt like it was a, such a release. No, again, I'm so so proud of you. <laughs> listen, listen, so I, truly I, proud of you. Listen, Em, I know we we've told you plenty of times in private conversations, but since we're on the air, it's only right we say it here as well. And the amount of time we've known you for a few years, you've always made us very proud with your work ethic. Thank you. Um, and and just the quality person that you are. And for people that don't know, um, you didn't just put this protest together because it's the end thing to do. This is something that you've always spoken out about. Mm -hmm. Um, and and just to rehash for people that may not remember. A year ago, you kind of put Hollywood on blast, what was going right. on, um, you know, in, in your sample, in, in your in, interactions with the red carpet and different celebrities. Mm -hmm. So we're very proud of you. We, you have our 100% support. You Thank know what I'm saying? We're fighting right there with you, and we want to continue to see you do these type of things. Can you, can you give us um, your, your patented uh, trademark quote, please, that I love so much? When you said, you know, you know the one, um, what is it? You can't, uh, you, you can't, can't have our... You, you can't... <laughs> You simply cannot love our rhythm and hate our blues, okay? You can't. And I said that today, because you already know. And when we stood in front of the statue of Robert Moses, yo, I wish, like, this is, it's giving me goosebumps. We sat there, and there was so many people. It was like, I feel like the whole white audience was silent. And I said to them, I said to them, this is a statue of a man that promoted segregation. And I said, do you know how it feels to go to colleges and sleep in resident halls named after people who beat, raped, sold Black people who look like me? For the self-esteem of Black people to walk in a town where you celebrate those who wanted and promoted segregation and wanted and promoted slavery. So all these white people are staring at me. And I said, let me give you an example to paint the picture. Would we have a statue of Hitler? Do y'all know who Hitler is? And, and the whole of the fire department was standing outside, all the police. I said, Hitler, if you don't know, who enslaved Jews, if we put up a statue and expected Jewish people to walk around the statue, that would be disgusting, right? That's how we feel. So then I said, on top of that, would you hear Nazi University? And I said, and I love the counter argument. Oh, you guys are mad about these statues of these people, but Robert Moses, he was a great, he was, he was known as the master builder. He was a great construction worker. So you guys keep saying that and not, not focusing on the race part. I said, did you guys know Hitler was very intelligent? He was great at art, great at music, so smart. I said, so if I said that, that sounds ridiculous for me to have that counter argument. 
So if you wouldn't want Hitler up here, you wouldn't want Nazi University, all this shit gotta go. And they just, I think, compare, Hitler has always been, you know what I'm saying? It's such a, to them, it's like, what? What did you say? Well, and it, yo, when I brought up Hitler, quiet. It's, it's, the, it's the perfect example. Perfect. Uh, as, 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 Killer Mike, as Killer Mike recently said, um, through his travels through the world, when he visits Europe, there is no inkling or connection to Hitler or the Nazi party. Right. And in fact, Germany is embarrassed that that's even part of their history. Yet here in America, we continue to tie our history to slave owners and those who push segregation. So that's a great point that you made, Em. It was intense. But, you know, again, we'll, we'll share clips, you know, hopefully next episode. And um, I think it's just important for everyone to just know, you know, no matter where you go in life, always go home to your home community where you are a familiar face. And sometimes doing that, when you're a familiar face, it is more digestible than randoms, people preaching to a town. So I think today hit home because like I said, we were our family that people respected, they loved, they, I mean, I heard people as we were walking, those, those are the Vickers girls, wow, wow, the Vickers girl. And it was like all of that to say, I'm still a black woman and so, it, it hits different. So go back to your schools, your universities, your colleges, your track teams. And one of the girls on the sideline, I heard her say to her mom, she came out last year and trained me on track. So her little racist mom that's shaking her head, nasty, the, her daughter remembered me because last year I did some volunteer, volunteer work and I went to the school and trained her daughter. And so it's, you know, sh just showing your faces. It's like, how can you, we're not, I'm not even like, I'm angry, but like, come on. Like, I'm trying to educate y'all. I'm not even coming here on some wild shit. But they don't you know want what I'm that. saying? They don't want that. You know what I'm saying? And I know this is, we're, we're veering into a conversation probably for another show, uh, specifically shooting a sh But yeah. um, we got to keep it 100, man. A, a lot of, like you said, um, you know, remaining quiet is, is condoning the violence. And a lot of white people don't want to have that conversation because they know secretly they have allowed these things to go on. And I yeah. love when people say, hey, I'm not racist, right? You may not be racist, but you have never checked your friends that are. Yep. You have never put your friends in their place when they've made inappropriate comments about other races. Yep. So because you're not racist, you should also keep that energy to say, I want to kill and silence all racism as well, as mm -hmm. opposed to allowing your friends to speak and do what they do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad you said that, um, Eric. As I've been actually, I've been waiting to, uh, to to talk to you guys about about this. I had actually, I got a I got a DM uh, from one of my old bosses when I was like when I was in Long Island and back in my LI days, um, I was at the PC Ridges in Greenville. One of my old bosses, he um, he DM me and um, he was just like he was like, listen, you know, I got a I got a lot of respect for you. Um, you know, I always treated you well when you when you worked at the store, and just kind of you know yada yada and um he was like listen you know i'm not picking sides or anything like that um but you know you know you got to look further into into things you know to see what's really going on mm -hmm. um so i you know so i, I hit him back and i you know i, I was trying to explain to him because he was more thinking when he when he was referring to picking sides he was more so referring to democrat republican and i was explaining to him that you know it's not about a political party. It's about the systemic racism that's been going on. And I said, listen, um, you know, I need you to pick a side, but I need you to pick a side of what's right. You know what I'm saying? And so we kind of had a little dialogue going back and forth, but at the end of the dialogue, he understood where I was coming from. And he said, listen, you know what? You're absolutely right. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna come out of my comfort zone and when I see people saying stuff or doing stuff that's that's wrong, I'm gonna start checking them. And um, you know, we just kind of, we kind of went back and forth a little bit longer, just just talking and whatnot. But it the the conversation I'm I'm gonna show it to you guys once we actually see each other because it's like a whole long um, dialogue. But I, I just like I was I got emotional inside because I was I was happy that we could actually have this conversation. And for at the end of that conversation him to really kind of understand and get it. And Eric, you know, me and you've been going back and forth this past week, you know, with people that, that don't get it. And a lot of people choose not to get it or they choose not to have that conversation. But it's, you know, it's, it's really just like, you could actually have a conversation, you know, and kind of have a better understanding, but 
people choose not to. They, they want to believe and do what they want to do, and that's going to be the end of it. And the conversation that you had with him was so important because it takes having those tough, tough conversations with people you actually know and love. It's so easy to be have Twitter fingers and get online and, and shout at a stranger, you're racist, and let me explain to you about my Black culture. But in those intimate conversations that you have with a neighbor, an old teammate, old coworker, a boss, those are tough because one, you're, you're dealing with the reality of, dang, you're really racist or you're ignorant. And then you're dealing with your emotions and the personal relationship. So I, you know, I'm proud of you for, for having that, that conversation and educating him as well, because yeah. it's not a us versus them and red versus blue and, and police versus black. It's like, it is a whole, it's racist yeah. versus everyone. Like, you know what I mean? And it's, it's racism and it's, it's systematic oppression. So um, that's those, the, my point is those, those uncomfortable conversations with those whom you know, it's, it's how we're going to incite change. Yeah. And I, and I had, you know, and I told him, I said, because one of the things that I explained to him was that we need you. We need your help. We need you to say, and that's because he was, you know, he was like, I know you have a platform and you have a big voice or whatever. And I told him, I said, listen, honestly, your voice will reach louder than any platform that I'm on yeah. as a, as a, as a white man in America. And it's and, 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 and you know and, and that's the, the sad part about it is we could do the show we could do the podcast, but our voices you know what I'm saying aren't going to be as loud. We need all of these all of the white people. We need everybody together to really be pushing. You know what I'm saying to end everything that's been going on. And shout out to uh to Governor Cuomo. Um, he put a couple of uh, new uh, laws in uh, in place in the state um, this past week. They act they signed everything. Um, so big shout out to him. I know he's definitely been stepping up and uh, doing his part during the time. So I just wanted to shout him out. Yeah, we, we got to continue to have these conversations. Um, I think it's it's very frustrating to the black community to see these people who turn a blind eye to at least the conversation. Have yeah. the dialogue. Get an understanding. Um, don't hide behind political parties because it's, it's, it's much deeper than that. Um, and, and, you know, it, at the beginning of, of this M. Trip and I kind of made an inside joke about, oh, black people have these issues because they vote Democrat. And that's, that's a jab that I take at people who want to avoid the real issues. It's so easy to say, oh, these are, you, you having these problems because you vote for that particular party. But at the end of the day, all politicians are supposed to do what's in the best interest of the people. Uh, a politician doesn't take office and say, I'm only doing what's in the best interest of my party. So you can't, you know, for a lot of people who like to divide it and make it seem like, well, these are Democratic issues. These are Republican. No, it's human issues, bro. These, these are real life issues that the black community have been facing for decades and centuries, really. But we're going to say decades, just, just from the time slaves were quote unquote freed, um, that have never been addressed. That conversation that people don't want to have. And people need to stop being stubborn and at least listen. Hear what people have to say. Hear what people are really dealing with. Because when you live in your own white world and you don't have to deal with some of these outside issues, it's a lot easier to turn a blind eye and make it seem like that isn't the world that we really live in. But it is the world we live in. You know what I'm saying? A, a black man getting pulled over in his car is a scary situation. Yeah, you're absolutely right, man. So, but again, definitely, you know, and I, I, again, I commend you for the work that you put in uh, today. Uh, I, I definitely applaud you. Um, we, and, and we ain't gonna stop. We, we're not gonna stop, you know, talking yeah. about this. You know, like that, the good thing, the good thing about this being our show, and, and you know, what I'm saying, like, we could talk about whatever we want to talk about. We're gonna get to some sports today, but we ain't gonna stop speaking out for our people and using our platform to to let the world know, you know, what I'm saying Absolutely. that there's still a lot more changes that need to be made in this country. I do want to just speak on, and I, and I know I don't, <clears throat> you know, mean to spend the entire episode talking about protesting and, and all ahead, of this, go but ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Um, Eric just made a really great point, and he was talking about those who may act like this isn't occurring or it's not the reality. I want to just kind of point out something that happened at the end, which was it spoke volumes, right? So I wanted to just bring up real quick a situation that happened towards the end of the protest. So basically at the end of the protest, this white woman came up to me and my sister and was like, hey, today was awesome. I brought my kids here. You know, my daughter actually went to, went to school with your sister, Asia, and she was so cute with her little braids. And I'm like, okay. What are you saying? Because I'm waiting for the but. I'm waiting for the introduction. So she says, I wanted to just provide you with some feedback. So I said, okay. And 
her feedback said, um, what she said was, you know, you want to make sure that you become a student at what you do. And I'm like, okay. So you really want to spend time in researching public speakers, people who speak to crowds, get them riled up, rally speakers. And I'm just looking at her because I'm just like, what are you saying? And she's like, I'm a life coach. So I'm a life coach, which I never understood. Life, but I'm not going to go there. I'm a life coach. And I think that I cursed a few times today during the protest. And it was just a few times that I cursed, but whatever, I cursed. Like, we're at a protest. Like, this is not kindergarten. So she said, oh, we could have done without the mother effers or the F-bombs that you, that you said. And I think people get the point across when you just speak to them in an educational, eloquent, well-spoken, classy way. And I said to her, even in your white woman privilege, you were trying to tell me how to police my pain. Even in your privilege, you felt so emboldened to walk over here and tell me that when you cried and told your story, that was impactful. When you gave us knowledge about Black Wall Street, that was impactful. But when you said that F-bomb, and I know what she's talking about, it was a part where I talked about Robert Moses, and I don't curse on air, but I said, I said, we walk into buildings named after slave owners. How the F do you think that makes us feel? That's when I said it, right? It wasn't like I was like, F you, F you, F you, F you. And I'm just saying that for y'all to know the context, right? She said, I, me cursing and not speaking in a classy, eloquent way. One, she tried to insinuate that I didn't know how to speak, right? And that I wasn't whatever. But what was so crazy about that moment, and this is why I brought it up because of, of what Eric said, it's like, even that moment, she had to execute her privilege to tell me to how to police and organize the protests that we organized. And I said, I'm sorry, you're not going to police my pain. I said, I understand you're a life coach, but you will never know how to understand how it feels to be a black woman. So you're not going to tell me about my experience. You're not going to sit here and tell me that me cursing. And I said, you know, when you go to a funeral, some people are quiet. Some people scream. Some people throw things. People grieve differently. As black people, we're grieving differently. Today was a safe space in a protest to scream, shout, kick, scream, whatever you needed to do to, to let it out. And there were some people in the crowd who were so emotional and I give them the mic to talk. This one girl went off. But you can tell she's a black attorney. And her sign said, I didn't go to law school to get murdered by police. Like, I didn't, like, how do you think she, that she feels? So when this woman tried to tell me how I should have done the protest, I was perplexed. And um, I think it just goes back to, the, to the, the privilege conversation. And I was so confused that she was trying to tell me that. And I just pretty much ended in saying, uh, when, Ka you know, when Kaepernick peacefully protested, you guys are trying to tell us how you want us to protest. That's not the point of a protest. It's for you to get shaken up a little bit. Well, that's, that's the problem. Uh, listen, a lot of white people, and it's not just white people. I don't want to make it seem like it's only white people because we know some Spanish people that are oblivious. We know some black people that are oblivious to what's really going on. There are a lot of people. Um, but I'm, for the sake of this discussion, because that was a white woman who approached you, I'm going to say white people. They are not listening to the message. They're just picking out what they want to pick out from the message. So as you said, for someone to sit there and say, oh, you could have done it this way. You could have done it that way. I could have done it my way. Because at the end of the day, this is my message and my pain that I want to convey to the people. As you said, when Black men and women peacefully protested, even before Kaepernick, they were holes, they had dogs sicked on them. When they, when they violently protested, now they're thugs and they're looters and look at them destroying the community. Like when they, just now, you know, a couple of weeks ago, when they were looting, it was like, oh my God, why are they doing this? We support peaceful protests. Really? Because when Kaepernick did it, y'all hated it. So, I mean, you like pick, first and foremost, listen to the pain and what the people are really saying to you first. And then secondly, like pick a side with it. If you prefer peaceful protests, say, hey, look, they're peaceful. I, I get it. They, that's their right. But don't nitpick the parts of the argument that, that fit your counter argument now. Oh, Emeril, you shouldn't have cursed. And then if you didn't curse, you know what she would have said? This was nice, but did you have to do it on a Sunday during the Lord's Day? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's always, it's always something. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, drawing away from the topic. Do you know, in the middle of me speaking, a guy walked up to my sister and I and said, I would love to know how you guys feel about abortion. I said, nope, you're not going to do that. We're not here for that. 
we're not here for that. We're talking about black lives who get murdered by the police. What's we're not doing that. Me? We're not doing that. But because again, people try to right. take you off your mission. They try to and minimize your message by doing things just like that. Then, oh, let's talk about, it's pride, trans, right. No, we are talking about black people dying. We're not talking about pride. We're not talking about gay. We're not talking about abortion. We're not even talking about pop. We're talking about black people, men, women, and children dying by police. That's why we're here today. So don't, the all lives and bringing stuff in, pay attention. I don't come to the St. Patrick's Day Parade and tell you to go talk about Jewish people today. Right. Exactly. I don't do that. <laughs> so right. people today, we're trying it, and I think that we did an excellent job staying on focus. And when that guy said that abortion thing, I said, no, you're not doing that. We're not doing that. We're talking about Black Lives Dying. So you can go to the back. Sorry. <laughs> and the like, I'll, answer, up, I'll answer your question as soon as you tell me how you feel about Black Lives Mattering. Right. And the, and the lady answer, that spoke answer to what me... That, what the topic is first. Yeah. yeah. The lady that spoke to me, here's the thing. She was marching with us. So, so even in, in our white allies and our white liberals, you have to be cognizant that you still have to educate them because they could be on the side of right where they are for the cause. But the fact that she came over and questioned me like that and still exercised her privilege. Today was a day to follow black leadership and black voices and elevate black voices and not, you're not the center. You are the yeah. center all the time. You're not the center. As so long as you, was, was, you say, yeah, we need to, we need to break down right now. Then I could understand <laughs> maybe she said right. something. But just for you, and, you know what I'm saying? Okay, I can't speak how I want to speak. Yeah, and, and um, I, I, I said to her, she said, even and then she and then when I talked about white privilege, she tried to say there was a black woman in the crowd who, who even said, "Wow, why would she curse and say that?" She didn't have to say that, which I don't believe, but this is what she said. And I said, "Oh, that's fine." I said, "You do know black people aren't a monolithic group, so that's fine." If she disagreed, that's fine. And I said, "You know what? I understand you're mad about a curse word, but this today could have gone differently." And I said, you are so lucky. I know you guys see this viral clip because I took this quote from it. I said, you guys are so lucky that all we want is justice and not revenge. Very lucky. And yeah, we, we, we posted the, the uh, there was the, the, the video with Power, uh, with Farrakhan in the group where he was just talking about, you know, we're not a violent people. Y'all are violent people. Y'all have a history of violence, killing people, looting, or all of this stuff. That's y'all history. That's not our yeah. history. For people that forget, the white man is the one who introduced violence to the black man. Yeah, <laughs> so exactly. So let, let's call it what it is. I mean, but Em, you, you did a great job. Um, listen, we ain't, gonna, we ain't gonna let the haters or the naysayers slow that down. Um, as, as Tripp mentioned, we gotta continue to have these discussions. We gotta continue to keep this in their face so that they understand this is not a fly-by-night movement or something that everyone's upset about now, mm -hmm. but this is something that's been brewing. And I'm thankful, Emru, that you went out there and you did what you did today. Like I said, you know you always have our support. Thank you yeah. so much. And ain't no getting over it either right. until we see change all across the board, everywhere. But now, now, now you, can, you can lead us into some mm -hmm. sports talk. <laughs> Tell us what you got for us today, Em. What do you got? What you want us to get into? We know the NBA is on the verge of returning. We're about a little more than a month away from the restart of the NBA season, but there are some players who are not excited about a restart, specifically uh, the vice president of the Players Association, Kyrie Irving, who is leading a group of guys they want to call this past Friday. Um, and I'll paraphrase what he said. Um, they are actually, actually considering skipping out on a restart of the season. Now, all the other players haven't been named yet. Kyrie is obviously the biggest name because he is the VP of the Players Association, but he said this isn't the right time to come back. Uh, he feels that the message can, needs to be continued, uh, driven home, and players coming back would just be a distraction for everyone uh, wow. right now. Uh, Austin Rivers um, was kind of on the opposite side of the argument. He didn't say we shouldn't play, but he said, hey, look, we understand it's a business, and this is the way we make money. So if we are going to come back, we should find a way to donate our salaries towards the Black Lives Matter movement and mm -hmm. continue to, to, to push the message, but at the same time, Let's be that escape for everyone who's been locked in their home for the past four months. Um, we know LeBron is, is eager to come back and play. And Patrick Beverly came out today and said, look, if LeBron is ready to play, I'm ready to play too. At the end of the day, this is a business, but we don't want to distract from the message that needs to be portrayed. So with that being said, guys, 
where do we stand? Should the players come back or should we continue to drive home the message? Well, let me, let me, let me say these uh, two things really quick. One, Kyrie wasn't going to be back anyway. We wouldn't, Kyrie still, technically he's still out hurt, so he wasn't going to be playing no way. And I do, I got to commend uh, the NBA though. You know what I'm saying? Like, we're not, we're not talking about the NFL. If this was the NFL, then I would probably feel like Kyrie feels. But the NBA has been very vocal. Mm -hmm. They have been putting in work for, for a while now. So, you know what I'm saying? I, I commend, and we all, we all have commended uh, Commissioner Adam Silva all the time for the work that he does. They support the players. You know, when, 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 they, when they had the, the hoodies on in Miami, when they had the I Can't Breathe t-shirts on, right. the NBA was, has been very supportive. So, you know what I'm saying? So I'm, I'm okay with them coming back, and I'm pretty sure that they're going to have something that they're going to do when the games start coming back, too. Just because that's how the NBA has always, like I said, they've always been very vocal, one. And then, and then two, just from, from the player's standpoint, yeah, you know, at the end of the day, you know, although uh, someone like Kyrie, who has a $100 million deal, mm -hmm. can afford to say, yeah, yep. let's just not play the rest of these games, them them guys once you start getting to the to the to the sixth seventh and down the thirteenth man on the roster everybody not in a position to to not you know what I'm saying get them had them checks coming in so yeah. I can also understand it you know from that point as well just to add to the support that Kyrie Irving um, has been receiving um, former NBA player uh, Stephen Jackson who was a great friend of George Floyd we've seen him on the front lines we've seen him really pressing the issue um, about Black Lives Matter. He basically said, this this isn't the time. Um, and he, he completely agrees. Uh, and I agree as well. I think this is the first time in history that the whole world's attention um, is on Black, Black lives. And we have such a short attention span, right? Things happen in the media, we shift to the next thing. And Brianna Taylor's officers that, that shot and killed her in her home have not been arrested. So to me, we still need a protest. We still need to cause an uproar. Um, they're not arrested. You have laws changing her name. Meanwhile, her killers are out on the loose. I was and just about so to say it. I think it's imperative. I think that we even did boycotting, okay? This is a marathon. 381 days in civil rights movement did, did Black people boycott the buses. That's how long it took. So I don't think a few weeks of protesting is enough. I think that if we have real black leadership and real black unity in the NBA, it will, it will really show like, yo, there's a real problem. Cause if dudes that are making millions and are black and they feel away, people are going to listen. And Kyrie is the perfect person for the message because he's one that is liked, no scandals, no issues. Um, great player. You know, he, he's a, he's a, he's a premier player. So he is um, a great person to push this. You, as you guys know, if you're a, uh, six men off the bench and you maybe aren't a franchise player, it's kind of hard for you to talk your shit about, about you know, certain things. So I, I will say, and I agree with you on a lot of things, except one thing. I don't think Kyrie was the right person for this, even though the message is correct. Here's mm -hmm. why. As the vice president of the Players Association and as someone who is in the top 1% as far as salary and endorsements, it is very easy for him to say, I'm not playing because he doesn't need that next check. And, and quite frankly, he probably doesn't need another check the rest of this year. Yeah. But when you represent the Players Association, remember, you're also representing those lower end guys who don't have guaranteed salaries, who really are living check to check. So when you put that kind of pressure on a guy who's the seventh, eighth, ninth man on the bench, mm -hmm. and you basically say, hey, we're not coming back to play, that guy's got some tough decisions to make now because he's got to look his family in the eye and be like, I know we need it, but I got to follow Kyrie's lead here. So I think Kyrie could have been a little, a little quieter in, in this stance. Not Again, not the message itself, but saying we shouldn't return and I'm, I'm, I'm leading this coalition of guys who don't want to come back. Yeah. Um, has, has, has he been, has he been, because uh, I mean, outside of this, like, I don't know. Has he, he hasn't been, been very vocal, but, but yeah, in, in his defense, he, he was just elected the VP of the Players Association this season. So no, no, I'm not even saying it now. I'm talking about in regards to like, you know, we spoke last, um, last week about Tobias Harris, Malcolm mm -hmm. Brogdon, uh, all of these guys that have actually been on the front line. But I, I haven't seen anything with Kyrie Irving Correct. being outspoken or being or protesting or anything like that. Correct. I, I have not either. He hasn't. Right. So I, I just think in, in that regards, when you are the face of 
the Players Association, remember, you're, you're the second face, I say, because Chris Paul is the president of the Players Association, Cry Reeves, the VP. When you are in charge of 400 plus guys, you have to take into consideration every guy's needs and wants. Um, but I will say, and we've all been in agreement in this, the NBA has always been frontline of standing with their players and defending their player stance and saying, look, these men need, need their platform to, to use it the right way and to speak on these issues. And I think there will be some sort of agreement between the Players Association and the NBA where it's like, look, let's get back to business because we know if we don't continue this season, it's going to affect our future earnings as well. People got to remember, if the NBA doesn't come back, it affects salary cap next year. It affects advertisement dollars next year. It affects future contracts for guys. So, again, if you're one of those middle-of-the-pack guys, you want the NBA to come back so it doesn't hurt your future money. Yeah. But on the yeah. flip side, hold the NBA accountable and say, hey, look, we need to put together some sort of fund that we can donate to for the Black Lives Matter movement. We need to put our own, the same it's way the NFL, the NFL just put out their um, very, very thought-provoking commercial with Patrick Mahomes, with Michael Thomas. The NBA could do the same thing. The NBA has the bigger names and the bigger faces and say, look, let's be a part of the movement while we're still playing. We don't want to distract from that. So every sure. commercial break, we're going to run our commercial where LeBron is letting you know the importance of Black Lives Matter. Every it's game... Nice. We, Every game will highlight that we are donating to these organizations and we encourage you to do the same. So it can be done. And like I said, Kyrie's message is, is right, but he's also got to understand that as a VP, you kind of got to tread lightly so that other guys aren't screwed on the back end of this. Yeah, because out of that 400, is probably maybe 50 that could really right. be like, all right, all right, we can skip these games. And then the other cats, they're going to need them checks. Yeah, that's that's true because there are there are people who are just entering to that this is their dream and they're making they're making their money. I just think there has to be, you know, I think I just agree with the fact that this is the first time the whole world's attention is on this issue because of the lack of distractions. So maybe if there's a way to come back but still con continue the conversation and make it in your face and you know I and I again we've, we've spoken so often about Adam Silver and and the NBA always doing a great job in supporting their players. I mean, even when they played and Eric Garner, his death occurred, there was no problem and no hesitation with them wearing their I Can't Breathe shirts. As you know, Roger good old, you know, Goodell would have had an issue with that. Um, but the NBA, you know, never really cared about the players speaking up. Um, and they supported, supported that. Right. Um, and that kind of moves us into Roger Goodell's very, I think, still weak and still tone deaf apology that he should have listened to his players. So this week there was a, you know, video that we all seen and we seen him give this apology and say we should have trusted our players. We should have listened to them. There's a huge problem going on with police brutality, with Black people. I was disgusted about the video because he should have said Colin Kaepernick's name. And I think that he should have been a man and said his name and been up and direct about that. Um, because we all know that Kaepernick, this affected his career. And he was at the front line. He was the most essential person in this um, peaceful protest. So I think that he owed him a direct apology to the world. So I think it was a cop out for him just kind of skating, oh, we should listen to our players. Um, but I, I was, it was a good like, if, if I told you so was a person, it would be Kaepernick, you know? So it was great to see just the acknowledgement, though, of, of your wrong. Yeah, I mean, that, that was nice, um, but, it, you know, well said. But we got to see, see the action from, from this point on. We spoke, uh, I think, maybe two weeks ago about how they had started to look into making changes on the Rooney Rule. And they they paused that, so they didn't, they didn't even they didn't even conclude that. You know what I'm saying? You talking about a league that's 75 percent African American, and there are no representation as far as ownership goes. None. There's no African American representation as far as owners go whatsoever. Now I know we got some some black folk out here that got enough money to buy a football team if they wanted to, but it's hard to get into the good old boys club. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, I'm, I'm disappointed in, 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 in Coach Pete Carroll. I felt like his statements were BS. Uh, yeah, we uh, we should have signed Kevin. Like I wish I had signed him. I regret it and all that. That's garbage. I don't want to. I don't want to hear that from you right now. Don't give me the. Oh man, the snowball is is is, uh, is the avalanche is coming down 
and let me just say some something right now so I don't look too bad. I don't want to hear that right now. I want to see action. I want to see some more minority coaches, some more minority offensive and defensive coordinators, some more GMs, some more presidents. I want to see some minority ownership in the NFL. And not the, I'm not talking about the 0.03% Asian that's in there. That's, that's all well and good. But we need some, some real minority representation. I would also like to see Jerry Jones. For all you, for you Dallas fans out there that love the, oh, you love the Cowboys, we're America's team, man, America's team. I want to see Jerry Jones speak, and I want to see some action by him. He's one of the main cats who was really on Kaepernick. Yeah. Or you can't tell here that was really getting that Kaepernick talking all that 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 smack. I want to see y'all step up. I want to I want to hear what you got to say. And the reason I I want to see I don't want to I don't want to read nothing. I want to be able to look into your face and see how genuine you are when you're speaking. You know. So other than that, anything that comes out of the B, the NFL right now is BS. Yeah. Um. I so I agree on a lot of points you made there. And and um. Uh. One the Pete Carroll. Um apology if that's what we want to call it is complete bs um because we on previous episode highlighted the fact that they brought kaepernick in for a workout and at the time the narrative coming out of seattle was well we didn't sign him because he didn't want to be a backup quarterback which was justifiable they had russell wilson so if you're telling us hey we brought him in for a workout and it just didn't work out because he wants to be a starter and we already have a starter fine but don't come back now and say we should have signed him like what were you signing him to? If you told us that it wasn't going to work anyway, what were you like, as, as yeah. Anthony said, are you just saying it just to throw something out there to look like an ally now? Like that's BS. Uh, Roger Goodell should have definitely apologized to Colin Kaepernick um, again for misreading the whole situation and not at least giving Kaepernick the opportunity to speak to him man to man to find out what was going on with Kaepernick. Um, they, However you feel about who blackballed um, Colin Kaepernick, who was the lead of it, was it certain teams? At the end of the day, Roger Goodell is the face of the NFL. And it was his job to make sure he had an understanding of what was going on with Colin Kaepernick, first and foremost. He never took that opportunity to apologize now. is way too late. Way too late. Uh, especially without saying his name. You should have said his name. Um, Jerry Jones, listen, we know Jerry Jones does everything for the cameras, bro. And, and I'm not expecting anything less from Jerry Jones uh, in that regard. Um, and as far as the Rooney rule, I want to wait and see. I'm taking a wait and see approach on it because I think we were all in agreement. We didn't want some little token adjustment of, oh, we're giving out draft picks if you hire somebody black or a minority. We want real change. So in order to see real change, at least with the Rooney rule, you've got to put some real action behind that and figure out how it can truly work. As I've said a million times, it's not just about giving someone of color an opportunity. It's about giving them a legit opportunity. You could hire any head coach that's black or brown for one year and then fire him and say, oh, it didn't work out. Get him out of here. Give guys a legitimate opportunity to show you that they can do the job. Um, and I've said it in our chat rooms before. I think the NFL needs to take, in, in regards to ownership, needs to take up some of the, the, the model that the NBA uses where the NBA will allow you to buy in as a low percentage, non-vocal owner. So you have no decision making, but you may be at 2%. But they use those years that you're on the lower end as a vetting process so that when a team becomes available, you can actually buy that team later on. Um, I think we've seen it in the NBA work because the owner of the Golden State Warriors was a lower end owner who for a few years had to be vetted. He didn't just, wasn't able to just buy the team outright right away. He had to be vetted in. So that's the way to do it. That's how you break up the good old boys club of he's white, he's my friend, let him buy the team, and we're going to keep this thing rolling. No, you've got to create equal opportunity. You've got to bring in some diversity. And that's the only way things are really going to change within either one of these leagues. Yeah. No, that's, you, you said it, man. Uh, that, that, that is actually a great idea because – I mean, the only thing that sucks is if we know the, 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 the owners, the NFL owners are full of, you know, what, are they going to let that happen? No, no, they're not. So, I, I so love, where we go? I love your points because what you're saying of kind of people, of these individuals in, in the NFL speaking up, it's like, we just need real action though. Like the hashtags are cool. The statuses are cool, I guess. 
the we stand in solidarity on your website nope. we nope. it's like okay but even i'll be honest one thing i'm not hyped about is painting the streets it's cool you know the the black lives on the street but it's like yo we really need like real change so right. um yeah until i see more black owners until i see the renewal completely changed and, and actually implemented in a way that's like beneficial um it's not we interviewed another we interviewed three black people so we gave a chance but we still hired white like that it's just like right. what are we doing what are we doing so i need i need more i need more from them i need them to acknowledge kaepernick and acknowledge that you tarnish his career try to uh just come for his character and come for his career and his money and um yeah i just think that there needs to be actual change and not just speaking and any coach that's saying oh i wish i could have should have would have it's like no yeah the, you know how we feel about that yeah the, the time for that is, is is gone already and i agree I and mean, that's why i've said from jump i'm not interested in the hashtags the tweets the pictures the comments until we see real action because unless somebody is sitting at home taking score of who said what and then if they follow through all of this goes by the wayside there, there are plenty of big businesses who are showing support and solidarity now because it's the end thing to do. Let's follow up six months from now. Let me see what your boardroom looks like. Let me see what your hiring practices look like. Do you still believe what you said during the protest or were you just saying it so that you would not lose out on a black dollar? And yeah. um, Starbucks is a perfect example of that. Starbucks was not gonna allow their employees to show solidarity, solidarity and show support to the Black Lives Matter movement. Yeah. Until everyone kept speaking up and until they realized we're yeah. going to lose out on a black dollar. Yeah. So now, you know what? All right. You know what? You got it. Go ahead, go ahead, guys. Go ahead. Wear your shirts. Do whatever you need to do. Just just don't. Let's not interrupt business. And, you know, we, we need to see more of that. And I will say this on the topic of NFL because it's on a rundown. I, I forgot to mention it. I do want to give a shout out to Baker Mayfield and J.J. Watt. Um, for not only openly saying they're going to kneel during the, the national anthem this year, but there were fans who tried to challenge them in their comments, and they immediately struck back at them and said, if you think this is about the flag, you're tone deaf. You don't understand what's going on. Yeah. And Baker Mayfield said himself, I was ignorant to the fact, and now I'm, I'm better educated, and I understand that how important this is. So shout out to those guys. Yeah. I, I want to see uh, how, how these – how Goodell – is going to uh, respond to our president because you know he's he's already Twitter fingers in it up. You know what I'm saying? He already started talking when the whole issue happened with Drew Brees. He already started speaking his piece. Um, you know, and I, I commend uh, Coach Pop. That's my, my guy, Coach Pop, man, because he already he, he dropped them comments in like we we want to see what's up. What y'all gonna say when the president who uh, you know quote unquote he supports peaceful protesters. Uh, the vice president, we support the peaceful protesters. What y'all gonna do this time when he start coming at y'all talking about, oh, y'all, you, you, you gotta take control of your, of your organization. When he start talking that, that mess that y'all know he's gonna come back around with, what are you going to say then? That's what I wanna know. Well, like I said, at some point, you know, we, we're going to have to hold these people accountable and we're going to have to double check on their actions. So right now it's the end thing to do. It's, it's popular to get on, on any social media platform and say how you support the black community and black lives matter. And, Oh, I didn't get it the first time, but now I understand. Well, make sure you continue to understand six months from now. Don't but you know what's, what's the beautiful and sad thing. And it's, it's, it's painful to even say this, but it's like, this situation was bigger than George Floyd, right? Like it, it, oh, yeah. it was a part of a whole entity of, it was, it was a lot of things that were happening with George Floyd happened to become the face of this in this, during this pandemic time where people, we had individuals attention. But look, last night, I, by the time I went to sleep to wake up for this protest, I had another name to write on the balloons that we had today, another name. So the thing is that, I don't want to speak life and say this is going to continue to happen because I pray it doesn't. But every time a black unarmed man gets shot by the police, we're here to remind you black lives. We were here to remind you that we matter. So these companies that felt emboldened in this time to speak, remember this because we're going to speak when the, you know, God forbid the next situation happens 
I remind you that you stand for us. I stand and you this and a third. So it's like, same thing with the NFL. When we see the discriminatory things occurring, we're going to remind you what you just said. So, you know, I think now we got people to actually come out and, and, and overtly, you know, say it. And we can now hold them accountable because you say you stand. So if you stand with us, then you stand with us. Correct. Oh. Continue standing. And they got that little, they, uh, they, they made a little donation to the pot. They, uh, they, the owners, all of these billionaire owners got together and uh, donated $250 million over 10 years. All these billionaire guys. That's what they, they you know, did a little, did a little white tea money out there for that's, the cause. That's, that's a start, but it doesn't end there. That's oh, no, a start. Right, that's a start. That's a start. But they getting all that back from the black consumer anyway. Yeah. So well, that's, The breakdown is only about, I think it was like 800000 per owner, though. That's all right. You, we know you're getting it back. So you continue to support and we got to continue to hold their feet to the fire to make sure that they understand that they will continue to support. And, and like I always say, the, the moment you don't want to support is the moment that we should start pulling a black dollar out of your business. Yeah. And that's what we, what we really got to do is we, we, we got to start hurting the pockets. All right. You say, you, you say you're going to change. We, we're going to see. We're going to give you a chance. We're going to see how you're going to handle this Rooney Rule situation. We're going to see if we're going to get some more minority ownership up in the NFL. If we don't see that, we're going to give you a little while. We're going to give you some time to get your, get your together. But if we don't start seeing that, then that's when it's like, oh, okay, I see where you stand now. Right. So now, now, we can't, now we can't go to these games no more. Now, now I, can't, I, can't, I can't buy this hat no more. I can't get that jersey no more. That's yeah. what we got to do. Shout out to MJ, though. MJ, at least as my owner... He, he's doing 10 million a year by himself. You know, I'm just, I'm just going to throw that out Listen, there. That's uh, it's crazy. And it's a beautiful thing, man. It's, I don't even want to try to make it a comparison because I know people for years have said, oh, MJ has never been an activist or he's never uh, shed light on his political views. It's, it's bigger than that. This is about, you know what I'm saying, mankind and understand that, again, not red, not blue. Listen, this was a man who, who, who was killed unjustly and... We need MJ's help. Simple as that. Listen, I we, again, if, we, if we're looking at these the, the the guys in the NFL and they they barely scraping together a million from each owner, and you got one owner, as even even though Jordan hasn't been as vocal, you know, what I'm saying as maybe some people would have liked for him to to have been in the past, but he after he's saying I'm gonna take ten million a year, yeah, at least. What, you know what I'm saying? Like that, that ten million is gonna go somewhere. It's gonna do. Do a right. lot of good for a lot of people, so. Absolutely. It is what it is, but uh, Amy, you might as well you might as well wrap us up, bring us home. So I know today's conversation, you know, <laughs> never goes as planned, but you know, I'm happy that we have this platform, guys, like from the bottom of my heart, to be able to go out and do what we what I did today in my hometown to come on here and be able to talk to it talk about it to the world to brooklyn to new york to you guys is really um therapeutic for me so um once again thank you all for tuning in for another live episode of real fans real talk as we talk about not just sports but real issues that affect us all so thank you so much and stay tuned and as always be cool like be cool <laughs> Peace. oh my Peace. <laughs> Uh huh. This is real fans, real talk. talk. Real fans, real talk. We as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk. We the illest of course. Real fans, real talk. We the illest of course. Real fans, real talk. We as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk. Reporting live from the cam. High in demand, so please stand by if you can. What we got is worth a lot, so put a tie in your plans. On court, talk of sports through the eyes of the fans. With Trip Young, Emerald Marie, Eric Sanchez. You heard what I said, we elite. Check the latest topics and stay ahead of the beat. Keep us in your topics and uh -huh. we ahead of the Yo, streets. It's Johnny Flores, bringing a different type of blend. Backing up Misfit to make sure y'all tuned in. You gotta watch, this show is one of a kind. Updates on your TV screen from 8 to 9. For the older folks, so even if you're younger, no matter what sport, this show, we got it covered. It's filmed live in the middle of BK, so we Ain't no better sports show to watch on Thursdays. Real, real fans, show. real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought.
Fellas, 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 fellas